Can you say those things in yeah. beautiful? Good afternoon, you all. Welcome to ACMW. Let me see. Yeah. All right, today we're going to be talking about a career in cybersecurity. So if you don't know what cybersecurity is, or you're interested in hearing about the potential opportunities within this field, this meeting is for you. We will be having Dr. Chu come and speak about cybersecurity and its importance in the field, along with his experiences along the way. But before we do get started with today's meeting, I will be going over some announcements. If you're completely new to ACM, if this is your first event that you're coming to, I highly encourage you all to scan this QR code. By scanning this QR code, you will be able to become a member, and membership is absolutely free this year. You will be eligible for free swag, giveaways, and even internship opportunities. But for all of y'all who are returning, you know the drill. Go ahead and scan that QR code so y'all can be um, kept up to date with any information that we have, and you'll be getting closer to becoming a full and fledged member, and you'll be receiving your t-shirt this year for those who do complete the uh, requirements, which is attending 15% of our meetings. Now, as y'all are scanning those QR codes, I will be going over some events. Um, on the 18th of November, two weeks from now, we're planning to host an event. Um, we're still working on it, but we will plan on bringing something for y'all to come in here and learn new things about it. And then on December the 2nd, we will be having a holiday social. We will be having some hot chocolate and call it holiday cartoons um, for those who want to get revenge on Miro on the Connect 4 tournament. This is your chance to come and play Connect 4 once again and just get to know the officers a little bit more. But aside from this, this these are the opportunities for this weekend. Um, this weekend, ICPC is having a hybrid meeting on Discord. So ICPC is an intercollegiate programming contest. and um, they better they help you to better prepare yourself and know tech interviews that you will have in the future. So they go over questions that you would typically see in interviews. And by coming to these meetings, you will be able to get a lot more experience and better prepare for yourself. Aside from that, they usually have free donuts, but I believe this is um, a virtual meeting for this weekend. So if you're interested, definitely come and join on the Discord. Aside from that, we have the STEM Fair this upcoming weekend. So if you're interested in helping kids make a bracelet, um, with the first and last initials in binary with the help of a converter, you should come and help them out. Um, there's no experience necessary, so you can sign up here. And if you do sign up for a two-hour time slot, it will count as a one um, as one point for the meetings that you need for the fall semester to get that ACM t-shirt. And then aside from this, as always, we have ATV, who is one of our sponsors, and they have offered internship opportunities for this semester or this summer. So if you're interested in cybersecurity, data solutions, IT technology, software engineering, systems developers, UI, UX design, this is your call to action. You also scan those QR codes. And even if you don't have any prior experiences, still go ahead and scan that QR code, as you never know if you'll be able to land that opportunity or not. So I see that some people are scanning those QR codes, so I'll leave it up for just a second. And all right, with that being stated, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's meeting for today. Today, we'll be having Dr. Chu come and talk about what is and why cybersecurity. Hi, good 
the wind well from passenger goes at the back. Okay, in that case, I'm not going to use the mic if, if that's all right. And by the way, I'm fully vaccinated, that's why I removed the mask because it's a bit hard to speak with the mask on. Yeah, it should be fine. So, uh, my name is Raymond. I'm actually with the Department of Information Systems and Data I also have a courtesy appointment with the Department of Computer Science and, mm -hmm. and also the Department of uh, ECE. Yeah, and engineering here at ESA. Um, I only moved to the US six years ago, five, years, five or six years ago, in August 2016. Before that, I, I was actually originally from Singapore. So, that's why I speak, I speak, I speak with a very strong Singapore accent. How many of you here have been to Singapore? Or, okay, that's good. So, where was that? Uh, Okay, right. I have not been back to Singapore for, for a number of years as well. So I think the last time was 2012 or 2013. So yes, I actually did most of my studies in Australia. So I spent about 15 years in Australia. I did my uh, undergrads and masters and PhD in Australia. And I heard some of you actually have a maths minor. My undergrad is actually yeah. in mathematics. I cannot emphasize on the importance of mathematics. I cannot overemphasize on the importance of mathematics, especially in cybersecurity, because many of the cybersecurity applications, whether it's coding, whether it's cryptography, actually requires a very strong mathematics and statistics foundation. So for example, my PhD is actually in cryptography. So I mean my, my underground, I'm sorry, my undergraduate mathematics background actually helps me because I took number theory, graph theory and so on. Those actually helps me to better understand cryptography. And that's actually very important when it comes to cybersecurity applications. Uh, later on. So after finishing my PhD, I should do a career change. I went to work for the Australian government for five years in uh, cybercrime and anti money laundering. And as part of the five years, I actually came to the US in 2009 on a Fulbright scholarship. So I actually went to Rutgers University uh, in Newark, New Jersey, as well as Palo Alto, which is in Silicon Valley, uh, 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 Zeros Park, wow. Palo Alto Research Center. So after um, working with the Australian government for five years, I actually returned to Academia. To work on uh, cybersecurity digital forensics. That's where I'm, I became uh, involved in digital forensic research, which is also partly because I used to work as a Singapore police officer. I mean, as a police officer in Singapore before I moved to Australia. So I was kind of interested to see what I can do by marrying my professional interests as well as my research interests, so crypto, cybercrime, and money laundering, policing, so that kind of converge into uh, digital forensics. And I only moved here in, but uh, before I moved here, I, as part of my career, I also spent some time in Singapore. So in 2000, in early 2015, Interpol actually set up a regional headquarters in, uh, in Singapore, which is the Asia Pacific uh, headquarters. And also, it's actually uh, where they know as I, IG, IGCF, Interpol Global Complex for Innovation. That's where they have their R&D and their digital forensic team as well. So when I was there, I was actually working on forensic by design. So for those of you, especially with a home science and computer engineering background, I'm sure you have heard of secure by design or software by design. Possible your software to do life cycle, right? So what we what I'm interested in is actually, is actually forensic by design in the sense that when the, when the when the system was hacked, do you know where to look for evidence? Maybe, maybe not. But many of you have heard of black box or the flight recorder on, on airplanes, right? So when the plane goes down touch wood, I mean the, the first place to look for evidence is actually in the black box recorder. So what we are trying to do here is also to something similar in the sense that we want to be able to design some sort of a digital policy web of recorder. So when the system was hacked, whether it's internally or externally, you know where to look for evidence. And of course, the importance of evidence is you have to ensure its integrity. So you must be able to secure these web box. So data integrity is very important. In addition to confidentiality and so on. I mean, availability and so on. So I only moved to UTSA in 2016 in August. So how I actually move around is kind of interesting as well because you may have noticed I kind of move from discipline to discipline and also from industry, from academia to government and then back to the academia. So, okay, if you want to, I can share my story because this is about uh, sharing my experience. So as I was finishing my PhD, I actually wanted to move city. So actually I, I was on the, on, 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 on the job market. So I actually emailed the, the PhD advisor of another student that I met at a conference in Brisbane, which is where I did my PhD. So I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm moving to Sydney in, in, in the next few months, so do you have, let me know if you have a position for me. So the person actually calls me up a few minutes after my email and said, look, do you want to come down to Sydney for interview because I was about to send out an offer letter to someone. The position is closed, but because of CV is what we are looking for. So he actually flew me to, to Sydney for interview. So some of you may have heard of Sydney. So Sydney is in Australia. Sydney is actually not the headquarters, it's not the capital city of Australia, it's actually the capital city of New South Wales. So Canberra is actually the capital city of Australia, but many people thought that Sydney is actually the capital of Australia. 
By the way, am I speaking too fast? Yes. Yes, okay. I'll try to slow down. <laughs> so, um, so, yes, uh, so the, the, the main um, destiny. So, actually, I flew down to Sydney for the interview and he offered me a job. So, when I was there, I wasn't really, I wasn't really happy with, with, the, with, the, with the environment, I guess. I actually spent two months in Europe for, for conference. So, I actually went to Italy, went to France, Germany. I also spent some time with Frank Hofer Institute for Secure Telecommunications in, in Darmstadt in Germany, so as part of my, uh, of my research and also my uh, University of Hostel. So for those of you who actually love to travel or who love to spend time overseas, consider uh, taking a PhD and joining academia because this is actually one job that takes you to travel overseas, to work overseas and so on. There's a lot of opportunities. So where can you find a job that actually pays you to learn, right? Because you pay to study here, of course some of you may be on scholarships, but in most cases, you have to pay to, to study here. Whereas in academia, you are being paid to learn. So, which is, so this is one career that I encourage you. Anyway, so uh, actually when I returned to Australia, so I was actually just looking for papers. So I found this very interesting paper written by my future boss then. So he, he, I mean, it's actually about, about cyber crime and phishing. So I said, oh, I'm interested in, in that paper of yours, but I couldn't find the paper online. I only see the title. Can you see, send me a copy of, of that paper? He said, sure. I said, by the way, I'll be in uh, Sydney uh, in, in two months' time. Do you want to have a chat? I said, sure, because that person is actually based in Canberra. So I met him up two months later. I still remember it was actually on a Friday evening, just after his conference, before he before his next flight back to Canberra. We have a chat for about one and a half hours. And the following Monday is actually the Queen's birthday, because in Australia, the Queen is the head of state. So although Monday is actually a Queen's birthday, and I, on Tuesday, I received a phone call. He said, are you interested to move to Canberra? We have a position we have not opened up yet, but because of the conversation, we would like to try you out. I said, sure. So I moved to Canberra. And then that was, uh, I was there for the next five years. And even going back to the uni, I say it's, well, return to academia because I used to study there, so the, the professor knows me, so they actually asked me to, to go back. But coming to the US is also interesting because in 2015, I was actually on sabbatical. That's where I actually spent some time in Singapore. Uh, in Singapore. But as a few months before then, I was actually going to attend a conference in Puerto Rico. And one of the session chairs is actually my current department at EcoBB. Some of you, I'm not sure how many of you know her, daughter of EcoBB. So actually, I emailed her and said, look, before the conference, well, a few months before the conference, I noticed that you are running a session on digital forensics. But on the program agenda, I did not see that session. So is this it still, still ongoing or not? Because I'm interested. He said, no, because we don't have enough submission, we are transferring that, that mini track. But are you interested to move to US? I said, sure. That's, I'm keeping my options open. So because it was in Puerto Rico and because I was on the six months sabbatical, I was trying to travel as light as I can. And given that it's August in Puerto Rico, I'm, sh I'm sure you know the weather is summer. So I was there in t-shirt and shorts and sandals. <laughs> I, I was expecting a full fresh interview because I wasn't used to the environment. Because coming from Australia, we are very laid back. In fact, I can go to lectures with t-shirt and shorts and sandals in Australia. <laughs> but not here, of course, in the US. So I was there, so I went to the I went there, I thought it's just a conversation again, but I never expected to be a full fresh interview. So on the other side of the panel uh, of the table, uh, three faculty members fully dressed. <laughs> I mean professionally dressed. So I was there in each as uh, so I apologize, I said sorry. First of all, I did not know it was an interview. Secondly, even if I want to change now, I have no clothes, <laughs> no, no 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 shirt and try to change it to so this I am who I am basically. So basically, I, I mean, after the interview, they flew me down to uh, UTSA a few months later in November for the interview, and I got a job. So that's where I moved to UTSA in 2016. So as you can see, three of my jobs, three out of four of my jobs, I kind of get the jobs through emails. And it was for, for totally a different reason. I wasn't looking for a job. So I was kind of lucky in a sense. So, but this also emphasized the importance of social networking, because networking, basically for me, going to conference is about networking. So keep your minds open, I mean, keep your options open, keep your mind open, and also network, because you never know where, where that uh, conversation or where that um, communication is going to take you. So I'm just sharing my experience in this case. Okay, so about cybersecurity. I'm sure this is not new to you, because many of you are what we call as the digital natives. So I'm not sure how many of you have, have heard of digital natives. So you are born with technologies. And then you have digital immigrant like myself. So when I I mean, during when, my, when I was growing up, there's no uh, iPads, there's no iPhones. So we have big digital universe. And of course, there's, we also have digital dinosaurs, which is not so nice. <laughs> anyway, so I'm sure you agree with this. These days, it's cyber and everything, in the sense that if you look around the room, you have a lot of digital devices. Ten years ago, if I asked someone, how many devices do you have? One, two, 
max. What, what laptop have or what mobile device? These days, many of you have more than two, three, because you have your TV or your similar, you have your mobile device, maybe a couple more devices, a laptop, and so on, or even things that are on, uh, whether it's things in us, on us, or on us. So we have cyber or everything. So what does that mean? So previously, if I want to rob you, or if I want, if I want to do something bad to you, I have to be in front of you physically, right? But these days, I can do it from my garage. I can do it from anywhere in the world, because you are connected, right? So that's why we call cyber or everything. And in a sense that many of our worlds, physical worlds are combined with the, with the cyber world. So we have cyber for my worlds, we have social media, and so on. And I'm not sure how many of you agree, or how many of you disagree with this statement, in the sense that in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except for Jeff and Hester, including as well as cyber speaking. How many of you disagree? No? <laughs> Agree or disagree? Mm -hmm. Not sure? Okay, how many of you agree with the statement? <laughs> okay, agree. So nothing in this world can be certain except for their access and self speed. Okay, how many of you disagree? Okay, why? Um, I don't know. Well, it says in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes, right? But the world is like drastically changing, and actually, technology is like changing exponentially. So, what we have today, we, I'm pretty sure we didn't know we were going to have like 20, 30 years ago. So, I guess the future is just uncertain. Technology is rapidly changing. That's right. But when you have to start the security, there's no systems in the world that's going to be 100% secure. So, for example, 10, 10 or 20 years ago, if I ask how many of your systems have been breached, most of them will raise their hand, right? Most of the people in the audience. But these days, not many people actually raise their hand because the thing is, even if you think that your system has not been breached, is it because it has not been breached or is it because you are not aware of it? Right? So it's not a matter of if, but this case is a matter of when your system will be breached and also when you'll be aware of it. I'm not sure how many of you, because earlier you mentioned about movies, so I'm not sure how many of you have watched this show, Brad Head, I think it's 2015. From recollection, I think uh, because when some when you were discussing uh, Maze Runner, I think it was in 2014. I did a Google check and I cheated. So I think I saw the movie a few years ago. So this movie was actually introduced, uh, but was actually out a year after Maze Runner. So I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have watched this. So basically, this movie is about a piece of malware. And again, I'm sure you know what malware is, a machine software. So basically, they actually uh, implant the malware on the machine. And because of the malware, they actually trigger a nuclear, I mean, a, a, a fire or explosion in China. And again, is this Hollywood? Maybe, maybe not. But this is one example of something that happens in the cyberspace. Cyberspace actually has physical consequences, have consequences in, in, the, in the physical world. This is just another uh, fast and furious. Again, I'm not sure how many of you have watched that, but this is one of the scenes where vehicles were compromised by hackers or by malicious actors to actually crash into other vehicles or to, uh, to do what they want. And again, you may think that this is Hollywood, but if you do a uh, YouTube search, you'll be able to find a number of um, with, um, videos that actually have recordings from uh, from researchers, whether in the States or overseas, uh, US, China, and other, other countries, where they actually have found out with these in um, uh, the electrical vehicles that they can be exploited remotely to actually take control of those vehicles. And you can find many of these videos on, on YouTube. And this is no longer Hollywood, it actually happens. So now the next question is who malicious actors. So in this case, malicious actors are, are defined as to be very broad. It can be cyber criminals, it can be nation state, it can be organized crime, or it can just be any body issues. Right? Do you think they will do you think they will actually exploit vulnerabilities, whether it's in driverless vehicles, drones? I'm sure many of you have prepared with drones and other um, technologies, and they use these technologies as physical weapons. So think about it, two years ago. There were a number of uh, it, there were a number of terrorist attacks in, in Europe, France, and uh, uh, I think Austria as, as well, where terrorists actually got behind the wheels and used the trucks as basically they drove the trucks into uh, places of mass gathering. What happened in the future instead of someone getting behind the wheels, if you identify vulnerabilities in these vehicles and then use them as weapon of mass destruction in the sense that you drove them into places of mass gatherings, coordinated in the in a number of countries, do you think that's Hollywood? Maybe, maybe for now, but who knows in the few years, that's what Joshua was saying, right? 
And how about carrying out cyber attacks concurrently with physical attacks to maximize impact? So, for example, if I'm the attack on city, say New York City or, um, or Wall Street. So, if I'm going to carry out an attack, I mean cyber and physical, I can actually take over um, uh, vehicles and then drive them to the into places of mass gathering. At the same time, I bring down the network, I bring down the communication, your, your phone network, the hospital network, and so on. Because, I mean, the, the thing is, what is the main purpose of terrorist attack other than body bags? You want to clear chaos, right? You want to clear panic. So uh, basically, it's a fear, uncertainty, and, and the, the FUD. So in this case, if you carry out a coordinated cyber and physical attack, or a number of cyber and physical attacks, you are going to maximize the impact of the attack. And this happened, who knows, right? These are some of our scenarios. And of course, I mean, from all these, I mean, from the number of stories that we have, they, they, they have read, I'm sure you have recognized by now, cyber threats are increasingly important. Not just in technologically advanced countries like the US, but also in developing countries and underdeveloped countries. Because most of us use technologies, unless you don't use technologies. But even if you do not use technologies, you rely on our electricity, right? So if your grid is down, there's a lot of things you cannot do. Right? That, that, that what happened in San Antonio a few months ago when we have uh, the snow. So when the grid is down, there's a lot of things we can't even charge the phone. And the, the question is how do we actually determine whether the cyber attack is criminal? Or an air war because cyber security has national security implications. But this is a conversation that I'm not going to have for now. So the question is cyber security has been around for a long time, right? Has been at least for the last 10 years. is not a thing of the past because I'm sure someone has think of a solution by then, by now. Well, look at this. This is from 2011, the report from the US Office of National Counter Intelligence Executive. And especially for those of you who are interested to work for government, the NSA, or some of the national security agency. These are some of the reports that they released. This is the unclassified version. So, look no, at 2011 and 2021. Cyber security apparently has not become less important. In fact, it has become more important over the, over, over the, the last 10 years. And increasingly moving ahead is going to be even more important. So, for those of you who are considering a career in cyber security, I can say well done because you are on the right track. Because this, I mean, this position is, is, a, is a job that's not going to go away, at least for the next 20, 30 years. And also, this is also very recent. In July 2021, the, uh, the House Committee of Energy and, uh, and uh, Commerce actually have a hearing on ransomware. So I'm sure many of you have thought of ransomware. In fact, Texas has been affected by ransomware, whether it's private company or government agencies. Right? So ransomware, again, ransomware is something very simple. It's just a piece of malware that makes use of encryption. And the, the thing is, many of these technologies have global usage. Encryption is good because I'm sure you have learned of data potentiality, right? You want to encrypt your data so that only you or anyone who has a web password or key can decrypt the data and read the content. You don't want anyone else to read, right? But the thing is, the same technology can be used for ransomware. Because if I encrypt your data, if I do not tell you the password to release it, your data is, you can't get access to, it, to your data, right? And this is a growing problem as well. So I'm just going to explain some of the cool stuff we do. But we are not hackers. So this there's a very there's a very important difference between hackers and researchers. So for example, this is actually a work that I did with three PhD but three master students that I met uh, during my orientation here at UTSA. So we started at the same time. They were in the MSIT program in my department, and I started as a new faculty. So I was actually working with them. I said, look, I'm interested in Bitcoin wallets. So, but I'm more interested in getting access to bitcoins to the store in the wallets without knowing the username and password. What can we do? So we basically we do an off, we basically we found vulnerabilities in two Bitcoin wallets that, that can be installed on Android uh, devices, and we do an offline brute force attack. Can anyone tell me what's the difference between online and offline brute force attack? Anyone? As the name suggests, online means you are doing it in real time. So for example, if I have your ATM card, and if I try to guess a password, I enter your your your, your, your number. After three times, incorrect attempts. The account will be locked out, right? So that's online. Offline means I, I do I, I did it offline. So basically, I, I, in most cases, you have you can have as many tries as you want. So what we did was we actually found a way to do an offline brute force attack, and we actually recover all the possible combinations. So in this case, what we did was we because we, the thing is, I mean, we, the thing is we actually found a vulnerability in, 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 in the sense that we are actually able to find the dictionary that can be used to reset the password, reset the account. So we did not try to guess the username and password. We 
we, we basically map out the entire dictionary of the words that can be used to reset an account. And by, by doing that, we actually managed to get access to the big coins in the wallet without even knowing the username and password. All it takes is only a few days. But the thing is, big coins, I still remember when we started to work on the research, the student actually bought a big coin. It was one to uh, 6,000 USD. So I think a year later, when we finished the research, we said, look, you can pay me back. Because I wasn't monitoring the price, I said, you can pay me back, I can reimburse you. I said, no, it's okay, we can't. We, we are going to keep the big coin. I said, well, okay, why? I said, because it's now one to 20,000. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so we did another, um, uh, research is actually with my students back in Australia. So we did another research on 3D printers. The thing is, how many of us actually use 3D printers at home? Not many of us do. So where are 3D printers used? Usually in commercial facilities, like factories and so on, right? The companies. So what do you think they use the 3D printers for? To print prototypes. So we are talking about IP. So what we did in this job is, in this way, is we actually found algorithms in the 3D printer such that we do not need to be connected to the 3D printer. All we need is just to be on the network. So for example, if there's a 3D printer on the ETS network, all I have to do is just to be connected on the same network the 3D printer is being connected to. Because of the vulnerability that we identified, we are able to hop to the 3D printer from the compromised device in the network and then extract data out from the 3D printer. So basically, you're talking about splitting IP. So basically, you are getting access to R&D. We are spending single cent on R&D because IP. That's, a, that's, a, that's what we did. And this is actually a few years old. This is also with my PhD student from Australia. He's now working for the defense in a similar capacity. So basically, we actually identify vulnerabilities in iPhones, iOS devices. So even, even though they have um, SSL TLS ventilation, we are actually able to circumvent the SSL TLS ventilation. So basically, the secure connection. And in this case, this, this, for this particular attack, we actually, all we need is actually the access to the device that have been paired. So when you were traveling, whether it's not on, on the plane or when you're traveling, just say with UTSA, how many of you actually charge your phone, not to the power socket, but to just any USB port? You don't? Okay, a few of you. But how many of you actually just use a power, do you know there's, there's a difference between data cable and the power only cable? So in most cases, by default, I mean, when, when, when you purchase your phone, they, I mean, the cable they give you allows you to transfer data as well. But there's a cable, there's a separate cable that you can buy, and it's only power only. So that means you cannot transfer data with a cable, it's more restricted. You can only use it to charge your phone, you cannot use it to transfer data. So what we did was, all we need is to get access to the device that you have paired out, pair your phone with, and then we are able to get a, a range of information from that device itself. We are getting access to your own device because you are synced with the device. So that's what we did. And this attack is very similar to the trust checking attack reviewed by a group of researchers from RSA uh, at the conference a year later. So these are some of the information that we can get, we get access to media, and also depends on whether the phone is password locked or unlocked, whether it has uh, is rooted or not. So we have uh, various information. We can get access to various information, like media, address phone, and so on. And also dating apps. How many of you actually use dating apps here, whether it's Tinder or some meeting at no. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so this is actually a project I'm very interested in. In fact, I have, uh, we have a couple of projects with, uh, with students here at Bank Australia. So because the thing is, when it comes to dating apps, for those of you who may or may not use dating apps, you know that there's a lot of sensitive information that you sh that users share on these dating apps. If information that they will not even share on Facebook or, uh, or even uh, some of the communication apps. I don't think what is common. Uh, I think it's, uh, what other communication apps do students use? You know? Sorry? Group no, no, this. I'm not thinking about grouping. Uh, Snapchat. Yes. So most of the dating apps actually consist of information that's even more sensitive than Snapchat because in most cases, especially the communications, whether it's a text message or the picture message, I mean, or the, or the images that you share, or even your swipe information, I mean, the, your swipe style. And what we found is most dating apps are actually not secure. And as you know, dating apps are a number of categories. So you have uh, Tinder, that's for the typical uh, straight category, and then you have apps for LBGT plus, and then you have apps for streamer as well. So what one of the students, one of MSIT students found is we were actually able to uh, use the uh, location information on the apps to find out who, who, who else in the neighborhood is actually a, a user of this app. And because of the nature of this app, it can be sensitive because it is a streamer app. 
So as you can see, how cascade depth it is. And the thing is, there is a lot of information you can actually get from this app. And in fact, we found that in this particular application, we examined a number of popular dating apps. We found that we can if we can uh, conduct a man in the man in the middle attack. This is a very basic attack. So basically, all you have to do is just to connect the, your mobile device to a Wi-Fi hotspot. So many of you are connected to uh, route, uh, UTS network, right? Or UTS student. The thing is, I can always set up a, a route Wi-Fi access point and say uh, UTS 2 Some of you may connect to this device, and that's how I can do many in the middle attack. Many of these they have end-to-end -end encryption, but the end-to-end -end is actually not between your mobile device and the service provider. It's between your mobile device and the next access point, which is my order. Right. And then in this case, we also did uh, Oliver um, data exploration. So what I'm interested in is, in some cases, for example, for, for systems in the air gap system, for air gap system. So air gap systems are basically systems that are not connected to the outside world. You can normally find that in the classified environment, you know, in for say NSA and others. So how, I mean, the thing is, how do I actually concentrate data from this system, given that if I have one of access to install something on, on the system? But this system has no connection to the outside world. So how do I actually concentrate data from this system? So what we did was we actually designed a very simple uh, program. It's just a radio program. So basically convert your additional data into sound waves and then transmit them out using high frequency in between 20, 21, 20 to 21 kilohertz because it's inaudible to most of our ears unless you have a kit or unless you have a pet in, in, uh, in the room. You'll not be able to tell those, those sounds. And the thing is, in this classified environment, you're not going to find a kit or a pet in the room. You're going to find working adults, right? What we have here. So you're not able to pick that out. Well, unless you have someone of hearing, hearing it, they might be able to pick that out. But other than that, it's not, it's not possible. So what we did was we actually demonstrated that it can be done on your laptop and on your mobile device. If you look at an Android device or your speaker, it doesn't require any permission. That means if you install the app on your on your on your, on your mobile, mobile device, it doesn't require permission, so you will not be alerted to the program that's running in the background. But of course, the, the, the trade-off is it's very slow and there's a limitation in terms of speed ones. So that's why you can actually use some sort of um, so it, because this research was actually done a few years ago, so there was actually a group of researchers from Singapore and Austria. They are actually interested to actually extend our work because the thing is, we have a limitation of five parameters. So you have to be within, you need to have that receiving device within five meters uh, of the mobile device to receive the data. And it's going to be very slow as well. So what I understood is actually to use a drone as, as, a, as, as a bouncing point. So you basically bounce and take the data from the, the drone, and the drone will go to the outside world. So that, that actually works too. Fun but not easy. We actually, three years ago, we actually submitted a paper to a conference and we were actually criticized, uh, as you can see, uh, by the sentences in red. So we were, we, were, we were criticized as being unethical because we actually came up with an SY2 that has no fix to it. And we actually released it on GitHub. So we actually criticized, so we had to bring out the, the, the tool. But anyway, since then, we have published paper. So basically, we actually uh, make use of assistive tools, we package the assistive tools into a package that we can actually use it as well. From devices or VMs. And there's no known patch on it. So these are some of the things that we have done. Yeah, of course, I think a number of you are actually in data science. These days, who can who cannot? I mean, I'm sure many of you who have thought of AI. So these days everybody knows AI. AI is a password. Or it's a, it's a, it's a data trend. So we have also used AI in some of our work as well. So for example, in this work, we actually designed an AI-based, only learning-based fuzzing puzzle. So for some of you who are actually in the red, red book in the offensive research, you know what's a fuzzy tool, right? A fuzzer, F U Z Z R. So basically it's actually a tool to help you to, to identify vulnerabilities. So the thing is many of these tools are not as effective, of course, they can find some of the basic vulnerabilities, but they may not be as effective if you want to find more sophisticated vulnerabilities. So basically we actually uh, design a, an AI-based fuzzy tool to help us identify vulnerabilities. We benchmark against some of the commercial vulnerabilities. And more interestingly, we actually identify nine recipe under vulnerabilities in the commercial middleware. And this is actually the, the this is actually from, from, from the company that we that we report to. And of course, we also analyze because these days a lot of traffic are actually, are actually encrypted end to end. I mean regardless of which end, but they're encrypted. So if you actually intercept the encrypted message, unless you have the key, you will not be able to read the content it says garbage, right? Because it's encrypted. But what we did in these two work is we actually identified, we, we were trying to do classification. 
So for example, we are only interested in certain traffic. So even though it's, it's encrypted, it's not that, because the encryption of different type of messages, for example, whether it's image or text file, they may have different patterns. So based on these patterns, we are able to classify the messages, even though they're encrypted, but it helps us do a triage. So it's very important when it comes to cybersecurity or forensics, we are able to do a triage. Because the thing is, there's so much information, you want to do a triage so that you can focus your attention on certain segment or certain portion of the data. So that's what we did over here. We are we show that we are able to do um, this style of classification on the So are you convinced yet? Are you interested in cybersecurity? Whether it's an offensive or defensive. In fact, some of my students have, have asked me and said, I'm interested in cybersecurity, but I'm not sure whether should I go from offensive or defensive, the break of the protein. To me, I think to me, my answer is always you have to be a, a good actor in order to be a good defender. Why? The thing is. Because, because I used to be a police officer as well, so to me, I think that you have to think like a bad guy in order to catch them. It doesn't mean that you have to be one. It doesn't have to be a hacker to, to be a good defender, but you have to know I mean, what they will do, I mean, what tools they are going to use, what, what habits, I mean, you, you basically have to understand them, right? So obviously, so to me, I think you have to be in both, uh, you have to try out both the ring and the blue team. So I know there are a few seniors here, I think you are one of them, I think there are three or four, or four seniors. So who are you, especially if I understand cybersecurity, because at least a, 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 a big demand for cybersecurity professionals here. Yeah. And when I say cybersecurity, I'm going to explain in my latest slide, it's very broad. It doesn't mean hacking only. Of course, hacking, if you are a good hacker, you are going to get a lot. I mean, the, the, the salary package is going to be a lot. It's going to be high. But at least cybersecurity is not just relating to, to hacking or breaking the system. It's also defending. It's also audit as well. So as you can see, and these are fairly new articles, I think they are all 2021. If uh, August 2021, at least the, I can't see the date. But anyway, I just I just updated my slide from, uh, a few days ago. So they, these are all from 2021. And as I mentioned, cybersecurity is very broad. It does it can be in the uh, public sector, it can be in the private sector, it can be in the economy around where I am now. So I think some of you mentioned that you are interested in local banks, uh, governments, or economy as well. There are, there are many different type of positions. And, and the worst can be technical, whatever you can be a great of protein. Technical can be vulnerability analysis, and tester, cybersecurity engineer, or tech. It can also be management of something, or possible C level expertise. Of course, you need experience before you can, you can become C level expertise. But you can go into consulting. Possible KPMG, the law at PricewaterCooper, Ernest and Young. We all have a great protein. Um, I think PwC has one in Houston because many of our MSIT graduates actually end up working for them. So, and you can also be policy as well, possible you have to. The thing is, working for government doesn't have to be on the technical side, it can be also on the policy side, right? Or you can be legal, law enforcement, or starting your own company. I think earlier, I, I, never, I, I did not hear anyone who's interested to start your own company. But that can also be an option. Although it may be daunting, it can be challenging, but that can also be an option as well. And I think, I believe UTSA will be sending out an email very shortly in the next few days or maybe next week. There will be a student uh, competition uh, if you have a business, good business idea uh, relating to data science. So if you have a good idea, you can actually try to do a sales pitch. And I think that the price is 20000 That's what I heard. Do not quote me on that, but that's what I heard. I think we should see that here soon. And as you can see, this is again something I found very recently as well. So these are, this is just a ballpark figure. So the thing is, some of us, some of us uh, salaries, something they can be as high as like 90 something thousand or 100 thousand, or at least in the high 70s. So, depending on which one you go through, uh, of course, the salary card uh, differs. And again, it differs between cities as well as um, uh, the sector as well. Usually, private sector pays more, followed by the government or academia. So, these are some of the rounds that you can go through. And yes, so how to get a job. Okay, this is actually a message sent by my, one of my MSIT students who actually started the same time as me. So as you can see, I think after two years, his pay package is so much the class. I think he actually has, and he only has a master, he doesn't even, he, he, he do not even need to have a PhD. So the, the salary is actually good. And how to get a job in cybersecurity, and many people have asked me as well. So do I need to do a master's or even a PhD? Well, that's it's not necessary. Or do I need a certain certification? Well, a certain certification is helpful. A bachelor is helpful, but at the end of the day, the, your, your paper qualification, whether it's a bachelor, your master's, or your certification, can only get you through the door. But how you perform is really up based on your, based on your own um, uh, interest, your own passion. Because cybersecurity, especially those of you who are working in the more technical area, 
the thing is about cybersecurity is very fast, it's like very fast pace. Something that you learned six months ago may be outdated now. Right? For example, for those of you working on mobile currencies, I'm not sure how many of you are working on reverse engineering or mobile currencies. I mean, when, when it comes to phones, it, it, it moves so fast. I think, even I think in the last three months, iOS has updated the version three times or four times. So with every update, there are some changes. For example, if you're working on currencies, it's going to affect how the way you actually acquire evidence. So the thing about some is it moves very fast. So the thing is, it can be a qualification, but it can also be a uh, certification. And as I mentioned before, startup is another option that you want to consider. UTSA actually has a site, uh, CITE. I think it's Center for Some Innovation. So have a, have a search for it, CITE. And if you're interested to go down that route, I think there's training programs that students can go in. I think they actually have mentoring programs as well. And there's also, there's also competition that, that the one I mentioned earlier is actually from them. So they have this on the, uh, on the annual basis. In fact, a group of students from EC that mentor um, their senior design two years ago, they actually won a competition at UTSA level and they also won a competition at the uh, regional level at UTD. So they actually uh, walked away with the championship. So what they did was, we had, because um, because when I moved to US, I realized that gun control is a big issue. And of course, I'm not getting into political uh, debate here. Uh, we all have our own views, but I'm concerned about my safety and the safety of the students on campus. So what I want them to do is, that's actually a, a project collaboration with NSA. So what I want them to do is, are we able to design AI algorithms, because we have a lot of CTVs on campus, are we able to actually design video analytics algorithms that can, that can kind of uh, detect consumer arms? Consume in this case, what if I have a phone here, even though it's consumed, but you can see the shape. Right? The, 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 the thing about I mean, the, the challenging thing about uh, weapons is because weapons can come in different shapes and forms. I mean, of course, you have bigger weapons that are higher, uh, harder to consume, but you have smaller weapons. So, can we actually design algorithms that can kind of help us to identify these and set an alert to say UTSAP in real time so that they can actually have a move? So, this is actually the project that we're actually working on. So, as, as you, for those of you who are working on data science, you know that when it comes to AI, we need data set to train the AI, AI models, right? So the thing is, there are not many uh, raw images out there that, that we can use for training. So, because there were actually four of them, so I, I believe some of them actually have uh, legally acquired acquired arms at home. So what they did was they actually used, so they actually uh, took, took, um, took the, their own images, so they actually uh, in various stages of uh, consumer for, for the arms. So they actually used that to train their AI model. And again, this is, this is also about cybersecurity, but cybersecurity is not just about uh, hacking the system. I mean, it's very broad. So between now and graduation, especially for those of you who are in your first and second year, is constantly enhance your experience and skills. It's not just getting a, a bad GPA. Of course, having a bad GPA or high GPA is very important. But especially if you're interested in cybersecurity in the technical aspects, I would strongly encourage you to actually go outside what you have learned and apply that in I believe there's student competitions, the capture the flag type of competition. I mean, if you, are, if you have a passion for those, go for it. Because the thing is, there's actually one way to actually enhance your skill to actually learn about new things that's outside the textbook. Because for cybersecurity, many of things are not just textbook. You need, you, you need to get your hands dirty, you need to be hands on. So, and of course, if, for those of you who are interested in graduate school or even uh, in the, when it comes to working for government, is the thing is, PhD can also be helpful because there's so many government research lab, the Air Force research lab. In fact, we have uh, Air Force research lab, uh, no, Army research lab uh, uh, on MPV building at level 3 or level 5. We have a National Security Collaboration Center as well. We also have people from NSA actually embedded within the National Security Collaboration Center on MPV level 5. So some of these actually have PhD, so they do research too. So the thing is, working for government doesn't mean that we can't do research, we can still do research. So if I understand, the thing is, my, my colleagues and I, we, are, we actually have a broad range of uh, projects. If you're interested in any of those, whether it's the way of uh, uh, research, as well. if you're interested in tech analysis, if you're interested in algorithms, if you're interested in reverse engineering, or even for AI research, possible we have uh, we have worked on a number of projects where we design or refine AI algorithms so that you can better detect anomalies on network or detect other things. One project I'm very interested in is actually to design AI algorithms to scan and filter drive for, for, the, for, for say, child pornography. So this is actually a project that I started, but kind of stopped because of COVID. So the thing is, many of these hard drives are actually encrypted. 
companies, when, I mean, usually for hard drive, they have child pornography or child abuse materials on them. Most of these hard drive, the, say 70% of the hard drive would be uh, video images or features instead of word document and others. Okay, can we actually design an AI algorithm that allows us to do triage? In the sense that, like what I mentioned earlier, the, the classification, the network classification, but now I'm interested to do a hard disk classification. We are decrypting the hard drive. I want to know what's going on this hard drive. Which hard drive has a large number of video files or images? So that we can actually get warrants or we can actually get a, a, a court warrant to actually decrypt those, those hard drives. So, this is actually one project I'm so interested in. This is a, this is a look about data science. But what we're interested in, in that project is actually to detect child abuse images, child porn. So, another project that I'm working on right now is actually on crypto, cryptocurrency uh, for the Bitcoin transaction. We want to do tracing and, and analysis because I have a partnership with the Anti Human Trafficking Initiative, uh, which is a non for profit organization based in New York. So as as through them, they actually have access to um, to, uh, to data, as well to Bitcoin uh, uh, addresses. They are known to be associated with human trafficking or sex trafficking. So I'm actually interested to actually do to actually help them to do a better analysis of those Bitcoin wallets of those Bitcoin transactions, so that we can build a network to see who's connected to who between the buyer and the seller, the peer and the customer, and also the victims. And another project is somewhat related is because they have collected a lot of social media data as well. So we are interested to do social media analysis to understand how does recruitment occur or, or advertisement for services so that we can actually target those. So those are some of the more meaningful projects, I guess, that are somewhat related to cybersecurity and, and AI. And of, of course, I mentioned earlier networking. So never never uh, underestimate the importance of networking, whether it's at conference or even at career fairs, because you never know. You, you may actually, I mean, your, your, your future boss will be just right across you. So, Networking is very important. I think that's correct. So that's all for me. You can always reach me by either emailing me or yeah, I think you should be able to it should be quite easy to find me. Just do a Google search for me, you should be able to find me better. If you want to discuss anything, you can always you can always keep me. Any questions? Yes. Um so where do we have time so doing like undergraduate research? As a freshman, there aren't a lot of opportunities just because we don't know as much yet. So, when could you start? You can start almost anytime. And again, depending on the program, the thing is, that, 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 I mean, there's two, there's two uh, avenues, so, so to speak. You can actually do independent study, depending on the program of study, or you can actually do just, I mean, uh, like outside of the program, you can do research with the professor. But, so, for example, usually for students without a good, without a very solid um, uh, hands on experience, they just want to like, test the water, I'll get them to do a digital review. So, for example, with one of the uh, bachelor DBA in cybersecurity student that I mentored two years ago, I actually got with him. Um, I actually got him to read a lot of papers and then to write that to actually publish that as well. So, I actually got him to actually understand to actually do a review of uh, the literature of blockchain application in, in healthcare. So, he can actually start. I think he actually started on that research in his second year. So, you can start most of the time. So, it really depends. And again, it depends on which professor you work with. Usually, for me, I will actually based on the experience of a student and then I will actually design projects to suit a student. So for example, over the last summer, I actually worked with a high school student from, uh, from Dallas. So he's actually one of the high achieving students. He, I mean, his ambition is actually not, his ambition, he wants to go to MIT. So he, I think as part of it, he wants to do research to actually enhance his, um, to increase his chance of getting to uh, MIT. So what we did was, I actually got him to do a deep review. So what we actually look at space information network, trying to understand what are some of the cybersecurity risks for space information network. And given that space, I'm sure many of you know that uh, space is one of the, one of the domains for, for 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 warfare, right? So increasingly, you find that there's a lot of space information network in the sense that there's connection between the satellite and the network uh, where we are. So I hope that answers your question. Good. So any of you who are interested in research can always contact me. I can always refer you out. I think I'm also in, somehow involved in the undergrad research committee of the College of Business. I'm also a first. Uh, I'm also a one of the first for the faculty member which have just started this semester. Any other questions? Yes, I believe um, the College of Business is opening up a pre PhD program. Do you, do you know about that? And if you do, could you talk a little bit more about what it is? 
Yes, I know about that, but I'm not very familiar with the pre-PhD program. I know who's in charge of that. I can, if I just send me an email, I can refer you to the right person. Yeah. I'm actually my department's PhD advisor, so basically I take care of the PhD program in my team. Gotcha. I can talk about that if you want, but yeah. no, I'm not familiar okay. with the pre-PhD program. That, uh, I actually just want to let you know there's a pre-PhD program here at ETSA, and they're accepting applications right now. You do not have to be a business student to apply, so it is open for everyone. They're looking for computer scientists and cybersecurity. It's if you're interested, I'll be dropping the link later down today in the Discord. That would be good, thank you. And we also have an honors college as well for some of you who are interested in the honors college. So I think that's, that's also an opportunity. And for some of our students who are actually uh, working on research as well for undergrads, there's actually an undergrad, um, I think it's, I forgot the name, there's actually a conference with UTSAS itself where you can actually, you can actually present your research in the uh, undergraduate research forum. It's an annual, I think it's either once a year or twice a year. Okay, let's go. Could you explain more about what blockchain is and how it relates to public health or sure. That's so I think many of many many people think of blockchain as either uh, Bitcoin or uh, Ethereum. So Ethereum is actually a smart contract. But the thing about blockchain is actually more than just uh and smart contract. So basically think of it a, a block. So a block is it's actually a, a block a system where every transaction is actually a block. So you know, so the block itself actually contains of the message, the, the, the message itself, and, and also the address that points to the next block, and also the address that points to the previous block. So that because it's a chain of block, so it is very hard to do modification without detection. So that's basically it in a nutshell. And the thing about blockchain is it can be used for many purposes. It can be used for authentication. It can be used as a database of sorts, for uh, to to, measure, to to preserve data integrity. But it can also be used to support other applications as well. For example, the way we use blockchain is we use blockchain in a number of ways. We use blockchain to support communication for us in some system, especially for IoT devices. And we also use blockchain to build a platform where we can actually facilitate federated learning. I'm not sure how many of you here are familiar with federated learning. So basically, federated learning is something like distributed learning. Just think about it. So assuming that we have 30 of us in this room, every one of you have your own data set. Some of you are willing to share, some of you are not able to share because of regulation. For example, if you're in healthcare or banking, you cannot share data set. But the thing is, we all have a common purpose. We want to train the model so that it can, it can the accuracy rate is actually much higher. As you know, AI models have to be trained using data sets. So in this case, when it comes to federated learning, I can actually split the model into say 30 shares, and each of you have one share. And then you, you, should, you train the, your local model on your own data set. And all you share at the end of the training is to share your trained AI model. And then because I'm actually the platform, so I'm going to collect all your uh, trade models, I'm going to merge them into one global model. So it, it's a win-win situation in the sense that now every one of you can have access to a global model that has been trained using 30 data sets, but does not require any of you to share your data set with, with, the, with the other 29%. Does that make sense? So we are, we are, this is something that I'm also working on as well. So we can actually use blockchain to facilitate the data sharing. We, we can use that to uh, build an ecosystem to facilitate data sharing or training. Thank so you. there's many applications. Yes. Okay. Is there a specific programming language that's best for going into cybersecurity, or is there not? Not really. I think there are, there are a couple of languages, like, like languages are Python is good for data scripting and so on. And then you have, uh, then you have to say in blockchain, I think, uh, smart contract, you have uh, Go, I think it's Go, and a few others. So there's really no one language, but there's But the thing is, when it comes to programming language, Usually you find that many of our programming languages they are somewhat similar, even though the syntax are different, but they are somewhat similar. So once you know a particular language, whether it's C or C++, you kind of, learning a second language is much easier. It's, it's very different from linguistic, ling, uh, ling, linguistic language because many of them are very different. But in terms of programming language, many of these words are the same. So it's somewhat easier to translate between the languages. Does that make sense? So I'm sure many of you have no uh, know how to use R, Python, and so on. So these are some of the more common languages. Any questions? Yes. Um, so you mentioned that like on one of your projects you're like it's unethical because there's no solution. Um, what like is that like a common thing in cybersecurity where you're like prevented from maybe releasing some research that exposes things that don't have a solution? Yes and no. I think uh, I was just reading a paper. From, I think um, there was actually a, a news release from I think Cambridge University uh, Professor Ross Anderson School. I think they found a vulnerability. I can't remember what they were because I, I was just skimming through the headline. 
we actually found a vulnerability that affects a number of systems uh, a, few, uh, a few months ago. So they actually connected a number of vendors. Some vendors were very responsive, some vendors were less responsive. But at the end of the day, they decided to release the vulnerability. They decided to make the vulnerability known, but they could not actually explain how you, how you can actually use as part of the vulnerability. So in the sense that they just announced that there's a vulnerability, we are going to details. So that everyone else is aware of it. And also it kind of put pressure on the vendors who are less responsive to be more responsible, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yes or no? Nice. And also there's DK education as well, because certain vulnerabilities, you find that some vendors are more, uh, uh, they may resort to legal means to stop. Because there have been a number of cases where researchers have been banned from speaking at conferences about the vulnerabilities. So they have, they have received a legal uh, receipts and I mean letters to asking them to stop. So it's not an easy or straightforward answer. <laughs> but to me, I think that's actually very interesting because I think, to me, I think that's actually why it's the most interesting is actually to find vulnerabilities. Because to me, I think it's easier to break things and fix things. I'm not really, well, I, I do design security solutions, but I'm much more interested in the breaking side. Because to me, I think that's more interesting. It's just like cyber security and cyber defending. Because just think about fiscal rule. It's much easier to, to defend the fiscal rule because all you have to do is just look at the asset, the asset at the end of window. But when you go to cyberspace, there's no such fiscal boundary. So there's many ways to gain. It can be uh, vulnerabilities in the people, process, and technology. Right? As long as you can find more one vulnerability and exploit it successfully, you are in it. So that's why, to me, I think it's more exciting. And it's much harder to defend as well. <laughs> okay, um, I think that's what I'm doing. I'm uh, teaching at home. Oh, yeah. sorry. Now it's not teaching. All righty, y'all. Well, thank you, Dr. Chi, so much for giving a talk here to ACM. I'm sure we really all appreciate it. I definitely learned something new. I'm a data scientist, and cybersecurity might be on my spectrum. But we'll see. But if y'all can give Dr. Chi a round of applause. Thank you so much, Dr. Chi, for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.